and welcome to the American Antiquarian Society's program on Pockets with Hannah Carlson. We welcome all of you who are here in our programming and classroom space, and also those of you who are on YouTube, the hundreds of you on YouTube. We are coming to you from the ancestral homelands of the Nipmuc tribal community who remain in active presence here in central Massachusetts. My name is Nan Wolverton, Vice President for Academic and Public Programs here, and we know that many of you return for our programs, and we're very grateful to see you here. But we also know that we have a lot of new faces, um, and so, uh, and particularly on YouTube. So I want to just say a few words about the society, and then we'll get started with the program. The AAS is a national research library with the mission to cultivate a deeper understanding of the American past, which is grounded in our growing collection of primary resources. And these are all materials that are pre-1900. The Society fosters a broad community of inquiry through inclusive programs and support of scholarship in the humanities, including in history, literature, and art. We welcome researchers from around the world and from right here in Worcester to use our collections, both the physical, real collections that they can hold in their hands and also our digital collections. We also host programs, programs like this one this evening. Um, and we hope that these programs provide insights into the past and provide resonance for today. And I am sure that tonight's program will do that, like many others have. You can learn more about the AAS by going to our website at AmericanAntiquarian.org. And I will just note that tonight's program is being recorded so that you can watch it later on YouTube or share it with someone. And just know that all of our programs are on YouTube. So it's a great way to go and, and view previous programs too. Um, we will have time for your questions uh, after the speaker presents. Um, and uh, we will be, have time for you to purchase books if you like. Our friends from Tidepool Books are here to, to sell books. Um, and Hannah has agreed to sign them as well. Um, and I will just note that as a nonprofit organization, we welcome any support that you can provide, and we thank you for that. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. Hannah Carlson is a senior lecturer in apparel design at the Rhode Island School of Design. She trained as a conservator of costume and textiles at the Fashion Institute of Technology, and in 2009, she earned her PhD in material culture from Boston University. Dr. Carlson conducted research for her, her recent book during a Stephen Botine Fellowship here in 2006. She later returned to AAS in 2011 to lead one of our signature programs, which are undergraduate American studies seminar for students at colleges and universities right here in Worcester. Her topic for that course was Dressing Democracy, Clothing, and Culture in America. We are delighted to welcome Hannah back to AAS to speak about her book, Pockets, An Intimate History of How We Keep Things Close, published by Algonquin Books of Chapel Hill, came out in 2023. Hannah, thank you. Um, thank you so much. It's so nice to be here, to be back here, to be in this beautiful new space. Thank you, Nan, for, for finding me. Um, being here was so lovely to be here as a fellow. Um, I was my first fellowship, and I remember, you know, feeling so embraced and feeling that the older scholars who had so much more knowledge <laughs> were so generous and willing to share. So it was just an, an amazing experience. Um, so I am here uh, today to say why why pockets, um, and I hope you know we get the room laughing so that we can show that YouTube that you know, we're here in real time. Um, yeah, so why, why pockets? Um, I cannot claim that pockets have changed the world, as do some of my favorite micro histories uh, that focus on the history of one single thing, often a single commodity, in order to offer some sort of unique insight into history. This has caused me no little angst. When I told people I was working on pockets, uh, I was greeted with either, ah, that's great, or really? <laughs> you mean pockets like in my pants? Uh, unsaid, but I heard it was, good luck with that. <laughs> um, a low point was discovering this piece by humorist Bruce McCall in an old New Yorker, lampooning the publishing world's huddling instinct, especially vis-a-vis -vis titles that have done well in the past. 
um, McCall proposed a veritable bookshelf of these histories, all making claims to how their object changed the world. Ping pong ball that changed the world, dishwater that changed the world. And there, sure enough, the penultimate in that illustrious list, the punchline, the pocket lint that changed the world. So I, I admit I laughed out loud, but it was also a very low moment. Um, if pockets haven't changed the world, uh, there is a lot of evidence, I think, about the way that people have used pockets to negotiate the world. So our reliance on pockets is so unthinking that a person could strip on the shore for a skinny dip and yet absentmindedly expect to have their pockets at their disposal. This happened um, in a scene in Robinson Crusoe. It's a scene we've all forgotten, but that was really infamous in the 1720s. It was called Daniel Defoe's Notorious Blunder. Defoe had allowed his famous castaway to wash up on his island with only a knife, a pipe, tobacco, and um, yeah, a knife, a pipe, and some tobacco. Not wanting to doom his character with such a meager inheritance, Defoe engineers a rescue. Crusoe spies his wrecked ship. You can sort of see it right there. Um, foundering just offshore and determined to investigate he strips his clothes so that he can swim to the boat. And once on board, he finds all this useful stuff, tools, um, food, and he stuffs his pockets full of the hardtack, which is a sort of sailor's biscuit, in his pockets before swimming back to the island, planning how he's going to salvage the rest of the stuff. Although unnoticed by readers today, the famous passage of Crusoe swimming to shore naked um, with his pockets full of biscuits, was the subject of lively speculation and worth like seven years after this, the London Journal was still reporting on it. Um, Defoe's continuity problem must have conjured faintly body images to receive all that attention. But for me, the punchline was pockets are that dependable, even naked, you could expect to have them. You know? And I think we all actually have that moment of being a temporary castaway. Have you ever oops, <laughs> done this? You know, when you lock yourself out of the car or lock yourself out of the house. Um, and I think it's that gesture that also suggests something about our expectation for what it means uh, to be dressed, to, be, to have our pockets. So I began to wonder, just what kind of a thing is a pocket? You know, even if we've tended to take, the, take them for granted, uh, they're a distinctive feature of clothing. They are stitched everywhere. There's a hint of opportunity shirt, trousers, vest, coat, overcoat, as the designer Bernard Rudolfsky showcased in this bit of infographics uh, produced for his 1944 MoMA exhibition. While distinctive, though, I think they're a really strange anomaly. Unlike zippers, belt loops, buttons, anything like that, Pockets don't help us put on or take off our clothes. Right? They're the only functional element of dress that has nothing to do with um, getting dressed. Um, they, don't they don't contribute to the project of getting dressed. It seems, I think, that they've been along for the ride. So I've come to think of them as sort of wily hitchhikers. So much of dress and fashion history focuses on appearances, as it should. But I wanted to explore our experiences living in clothes. Um, I believe our evident fondness for pockets uh, calls for a revision of what it means to be dressed. We should acknowledge that we've achieved our sense of self-sufficiency um, with all these secret compartments. We might not carry as much as does Robinson Crusoe in Tullio Pericoli's portrait. Which this is from a 1984 edition of Robinson Crusoe. Nevertheless, in assiduously accommodating handy implements, makers of clothing, recognize a tenacious partnership between garments and objects. With pocket at our sides, we need never be entirely alone. Even it feels that we're unaccountably stranded, right, and left to our own devices. So I'm going to just do a little quick tour of the book. It's vaguely chronological and also thematic. Uh, and it starts with, a, um, with origins. How did tailors come to think of adding pockets to our clothes? 
I do love a good origin story, but I have to admit most are apocryphal, and I also admit that I could not find, you know, any one tailor, uh, any one reason for pockets. Um, so in, you know, in most cultures and for much of the history of the West, people have carried what they need, talked about their clothing, often stuck into a belt or put in a bag that was itself attached to a belt. Um, pockets are not traditionally used in draped clothing, clothing that's folded, wrapped, uh, or tied around the body, such as a Japanese kimono, the Indian dhoti, um, or a sari, and the wraparound skirts that you see all around the world, East Asia, Africa, um, and the Pacific Islands. However, this clothing might have temporary pockets. Um, in the Roman toga, there was a sling-shaped fold called a sinus. Um, and the sinus uh, in Latin poetry referred to a fold, a winding, a secret space. Um, the late Roman emperor Augustus insisted that this space be searched for weapons before an audience with him. So there's a whole world of temporary pockets, but I didn't actually focus on that in the book. Um, oops. So in medieval Europe, both men and women carried purses, and they were status objects. One medieval handbook advised the well-dressed to deck themselves out with a silk purse. Um, even so, there were some gender differences, and you can see here in this image, men wore purses strapped to the belt at the waist. Uh, this was even more dashing and fashionable if you had a dagger struck through it. The dagger purse was a mark of bravado, uh, essential to the aristocratic warrior or ideal. Women, in contrast, uh, attached the purse to the belt, and they wore it dangling quite low. Um, Sorry. According to medieval poets, the placement of the belt and purse had enormous erotic appeal. Chaucer's Miller, one of the pilgrims in the Canterbury Tales, admires the beautiful Alison's girdle and describes the way the girdle and then the purse sort of walks, you know, moves as she walks sort of around and between her legs. So inset pockets, in fact, arose quite late in the context of European tailoring, tailoring traditions around sort of 1540. Um, as I mentioned, I don't think we are ever going to have or discover who had that aha moment. Uh, no tailor explains why uh, they began including pockets, but we do know where. It seems that pockets were first stitched into trunk hose. So trunk hose and breeches are sort of the same thing. They're used interchangeably. Uh, breeches um, appeared in a range of styles across Europe and might resemble stiff, rounded pumpkins or droopy, puffy bloomers. So distinctive of the masculine sex were they uh, that the power struggle between husband and wife, right, with the axes, um, for dominance in marriage was analogized as the fight for the breeches. As breeches took on symbolic significance as the seat of pa patriarchal power, they also started to perform some very real-world duties Right, they housed a lot of stuff. Uh, there seems to be something improvised about early pockets, as if some tailor said, huh, instead of this bag out here, I'm going to stuff it inside these big breeches. Um, the bag is clearly the uh, antecedent artifact, um, as historian of technology George Basala would call it. All made things, he suggests, have antecedents. No new things are ever pure creations of theory or ingenuity or fancy. In fact, the word pocket quite literally means little bag. So poche is the French for bag. In Anglo-Norman, it becomes poke. Add the diminutive et. You get poke et for little bag. Uh, in Janet Arnold's analysis in the right, you can see what looks very much like a drawstring bag. Um, there on the, what side is that, left? Um, these early pockets attached to the waistband, they might hang freely. They could be made out of really heavy duty, steady, sturdy material like leather. Some are just huge, 18 or 20 inches. Uh, and intriguingly, uh, tailors um, itemize them separately when they're charging their clients. So yoking bag to breeches in what looks like an improv improvisational lash up, um, I think tailors created a tool that was really quite different than the, than the purse. It was much more private and personal. It was not public facing. Uh, and the meanings and uses could not have been foreseen. Uh, oops. Uh, 
pockets would seem to be just a newfangled, cool, nifty device. Um, yet people reacted to them with some anxiety. And this is evident in a number of proclamations uh, in the mid, late 16th century. And much of this has to do with a coincidence. The emergence of the wheel lock pistol in the early 16th century reduced the size of firearms to something that could be easily concealed. So these new pocket dags, as small-scaled hand, handguns were, were known, and the fact that they could be carried privily vexed the British monarchy. In 1579, Queen Elizabeth I enacted a regulation banning guns that may be hid in a pocket or like place about a man's body to be carried covertly. Um, according to James I, pocket pistols were odious instruments of mischief and murder. He lamented that his peaceable kingdom had been polluted with blood. Only desperate persons carried pocket dags, according to this edict of James I. Even if only the smallest minority of men were murderers or robbers, intent on their evil schemes, this early use of pockets was clearly sensational. Uh, in 1584, Prince William of Orange was assassinated by a wheel lock pistol. This is the first assassination by handgun. Uh, but the assassin was, you know, walked up to him and sort of went like this as if to hand him a letter, but instead pulled out this gun. The attack was widely assumed to be an unmanly one for its reliance on a weapon hidden in clothing. In one's pockets, one could carry something that gave you an internal source of confidence. The guy was sort of slouchy and not very brave looking, and people were like, what? <laughs> this guy carried off this thing? Um, soon, people could not imagine not having access to private space when in public. Uh, they came to feel that everyday encounters might require some kind of concealment or dissimulation. So and from, it, from their inception, pockets are experienced as a sort of quasi-extension of the person. Uh, in drama and literature, exploring the contents of pockets is sort of an irresistible shorthand for taking the person's measure. Um, their depth is often exaggerated to great degree. According to Shakespeare, Caesar enjoys such outsized, outsized power that he carried the moon in his pocket. So it's really fun looking at 16th century literature. Mm. for pocket references. So why exchange purses for pockets? Why didn't pockets and purses simply uh, coexist in menswear? This portrait of Robert Dudley in 1564 um, shows him, I think, wearing really the last gasp of the fashionable male purse. But it, you know, it demonstrates that a gentleman could accommodate a purse, uh, your dagger, the sword about your waist, while wearing pretty big breeches that probably had a pocket. Yet it seems as though as pockets come into general use, they sort of compel this, I don't know, allegiance. Um, by the end of the century, only um, the very unfashionable still had those side pouches. It seemed that in welcoming pockets, men swapped spectacle, you know, that lovely dagger purse, um, for a private retreat, retreat, a secret territory of their own. Ah, sorry. So enthusiasm for pockets had a, led to a sort of self-perpetuating momentum. Having first appeared in men's trunk hose, so that's the two-piece sort of doublet and hose, um, they just sort of proliferate in the masculine three-piece suit. Tailors, at any rate, found every opportunity to fold in more of them where space allowed. And it's when they get to the suit that they take on the flat sort of envelope shape that we are accustomed to. Pockets are a feature of the most elaborate court coats, where foliate embroidery wound around the flaps. And they are a feature of even workwear that might achieve decorative effects with a simple shift from you know, the vertical stripe to the horizontal. As pockets proliferated, it is clear that they fostered actual privileges. Um, not all suit coats were supplied with pockets. Pockets were not a universal feature of clothing in the 18th century. This is all clothing that's made all by hand. And I think surprisingly, the absence of pockets was sometimes noted in the paragraph-long advertisements po posted by enslavers and employers who sought the return of runaways. In 1767, uh, when the indentured apprentice James Axley ran away from Williamsburg, Virginia, a, a courthouse, a court official noted that Axley wore a gray cloth coat without pockets or flaps. 
according to the enslaver James Walker, a runaway named Edom went to extraordinary lengths to alter his clothing on the eve of his escape in 1770. Edom dyed his cotton jacket brown, altering what was likely poor quality undyed wool to a darker, more formal color. He also put pockets in and cuffs to the coat, indicating a knowledge of fashion. Through their stitching, runaways might add functional space, useful in flight, while also critically transforming a mean livery of slavery, a pocketless coat, into something more distinguished and worldly. Uh, as soon as pockets develop, of course, makers and tradesmen begin to miniaturize useful instruments with a notion of portability in mind. Thomas Jefferson was called a walking calculator by his friends for all the small-scale instruments he carried. He carried a thermometer, a surveying compass, a pocket sextant, a level, writing instruments, a mini globe, and a notebook. Knowing required tooling, as scholars have remarked about the Enlightenment, the suit enabled self-assured, go-getting modern man to act and do, to measure and record, and to remain highly refined. Tradesmen also crafted bejeweled snuff boxes, lovely traveling cases called etui, which um, housed all sorts of things for grooming, small-scale mirrors, tweezers, ear spoons, toothpicks, and scent bottles. So the man's 18th century coat uh, came, I think, more closely to resemble a cupboard, you know, with bureau drawers. Uh, it was like a portable storehouse, as much an artifact of modernity as all those precision instruments and tools. So an overlooked privilege, I think, um, afforded by the pocketed suit was the refuge it provided hands. Uh, we put all sorts of objects in our pockets, but I think it's hands that have received actually the most attention. And I think it was really my favorite chapter to write. Um, etiquette guides of the 18th and 19th centuries warned men that it was in fact rude to strut about with their hands in their trouser pockets. Trouser pockets locate to lust. They are placed in and around the erogenous zones, as the poet Harold Nemiroff observed. We know what that gentleman is doing in the uh, doorway in the famous Hogarth print as he holds his hand in his pocket and leers at the women who have come to the city apparently to be led to a life of prostitution. Uh, trouser pockets, proximity to the genital area has made the gesture seem rude. Only vulgar boys dared thrust their hands in their pockets, warned the compiler of a 1758 guide. Uh, fashion, though, delights in mocking the moral pretensions of the day. When this French courtier on the left brushed aside his coat to stick his hands in his pockets, striking a languorous pose, he demonstrated how useful it was to break the rules of propriety. Somehow, courtiers had elevated rudeness, managing to look fashionably nonchalant and ever so slick. He is both rakish and aloof, somewhat standoffish, even as admonitions to take your hands out of your pocket, young boy, you know, increase with uh, you know, anxiety. Um, all sorts of men found it a very attractive gesture, from the flirting guy at the park to the fashionable fop. And the attitude, I think, is attractive and has remained attractive because it oscillates um, between sort of sexual and emotional registers. Folks who study gesture, including orators and painters, show how, how much metaphorical thinking is at work when we're trying to sort of conceive of how people are standing or moving. Um, the hand, and this I think is the amazing thing, it doesn't even need to be visible. I'm always going like this. It does not even need to be visible to sort of suggest something. Um, two Greek orators, um, for example, had a heated debate over the proper placement of the hand in the toga. A sheen pictured on the left believed the hand held in the toga indicated modesty and reserve. Demosthenes, his critic, preferred the greater force of the hand in motion, allowed to sort of emphasize some point. So that debate was picked up by 18th century portrait painters. Um, and they were aware of it. And they recruited that hand in the toga, brought it to the hand in the waistcoat uh, to suggest a gentlemanly reserve. So I'm getting to the pockets, don't worry. But I think that later uh, theorists would sort of agree that 
understanding that the hand is contained, um, say, in a pocket, we translate that containment to other registers. Uh, and in an imaginative leap, we imagine that the attitude reflects the person's emotional restraint, their inaccessibility, maybe even their disengagement. Uh, and that's why I think uh, Walt Whitman looks so cool in his iconic frontispiece to Leaves of Grass. Whitman balances a barely restrained sexuality. Uh, he had the print altered so that the bulge in his pants would be darker uh, with thoughtful intensity. So he's sexy and a bit removed. Yet even Whitman had some doubts about his attitude. He worried about what critics called his vulgar pose. It looks as though I'm saying defiantly, to hell with you. But he also really loved it, remarking, it is natural, honest, easy, as spontaneous as you are, as I am, in this instant, as we talk together. Whitman, I think, hit on this really amazing middle ground. He helped to redefine what modern ease might look like in a democracy. Um, whoa, this thing is really... OK. He wanted to look insouciant, like the courtiers, but not pompous or affected. Nor did he want to look quite so res respectable as his fan, Emerson. Um, and to this day, long after the retreat of formal deportment, putting one's hands in one's pockets remains a pose assumed by um, stylish sophisticates, troubled loners, hipsters, wannabes. The pose is employed in fashion spreads and advertising and all sorts of self-promotion. Um, I think pockets then, when acting as harbors for the hand, then right, have some surprising uses. It's not just to carry stuff. The hands in pocket gesture can help underline a, a person's sexual charisma and their mystery. OK. Whitman's cool. Mm. A sexy attitude, though, was not available to everyone. When these three fellows from Vermont dress up in masculine attire, ditching the corsets and long skirts that were required in the 1890s, they seem delighted to discover what you could do with your pockets. As the New York Tribune remarked in 1910, many a woman, many a young woman wants to strut down the avenue just like her brother. Um, that women's wear in general has had such a dearth of pockets compared to men's wear is really one of the most perplexing things about this artifact. Um, and in the book, I trace the way uh, different trajectories of men's wear and women's wear, you know, they're, you know, not only the, the way that men's wear and women's wear has had different trajectories and been produced in different ways, but, but the ideas that make that true. So the first thing to note is that for many centuries, the imbalance really did not seem to bother women. Um, when Defoe's plucky con woman, Ma Flanders, remarks that she is at home anywhere with money in her pocket, she was referring to an artifact that we are, in fact, not familiar with. And that's the tie-on pocket, what historians to call a tie-on pocket. So women begin to wear tie-on pockets in the late 17th century. Um, they came either as singletons or as pairs. They were tied you know, around your waist, worn under the skirt. You could reach them by a slit in the skirt that was called a pocket slit. They were elaborately embroidered, some of them. Others were patched together out of scraps. Women gave them as gifts. They were signed. They were dated. Um, yet all this care and work was not meant to be seen in public. They were worn under your skirt. They were private. They were counted in laundry lists as a kind of um, uh, underwear. And tie-on pockets received hard use, and they needed to be exchanged after they wore out beyond repair. Sally Bronston, for example, uh, in service um, to her Boston employers, um, the Davenports, recorded in this handmade um, diary that she received a total of 11 pockets, four old and seven new, in the course of about six years. So before about 1800, one could say that women were not pocketless, but differently pocketed. And a change in fashion at the end of the 18th century, however, ultimately threatened the, this sort of wonderful artifact to tie a pocket. So with that high-waisted dress, uh, there was really narrow, there's really no more place for the tie-on pocket. And to compensate, women begin to carry tiny purses called reticules, uh, from the French reticule, derived from the Latin reticulum, a diminutive of net. 
Um, and as a Londoner, Londoner marveled in 1817, women now walked with their pockets in their hands. Right? So the pocket is literally coming out from under the skirt. Um, the sight of women carrying the handheld reticule inspired mockery. While men wear their hands and their pockets so grand, the ladies have pockets to wear in their hand. This moment marks the, the divide, the pocket purse divide. The, this reticule is considered the first fashion handbag of the modern era. Um, and you know, right away, it also begins the suspicion. The notion that there is this sexual politics around preparedness starts right here. Uh, and you see this simmering sort of proxy battle of the sexes uh, begin. So why not just insert pockets into skirts, you know, as, as like menswear? Uh, over the course of the 19th century, that did happen. In the 1860s, for example, those big bell hoop skirts, really easy to get the pocket uh, in the side seam. But when those hoop skirts go out of style, women's pockets migrated in, in really haphazard ways. So in the 1870s and 80s, dresses flattened out in the front. Uh, and as they flattened out in the front, um, you sort of get this huge, enormous bustle at the rump. Dressmakers did the best they could, sort of putting a single pocket, you know, right in that hoop, I mean, in that bustle. That pocket was hard to reach. It involved struggle and contortion. Uh, women writing to the sort of new mar magazines like Harper's said, pockets were more difficult to locate than paradise. They were practically inextricable when needed. Um, by the 1880s, uh, women are calling their dearth of pockets their greatest lack. Um, and a number of, number of women's rights activists begin to agitate with much earnestness on behalf of the women, of, on the behalf of the right of women to have and enjoy pockets. Without pockets, they recognized, you are not equipped for the real contest. Even the New York Times pointed out the problem in 1899. The headline makes it clear, men's clothes full of them, while women have but few. Yet civilization demands them. The article notes that while men's pockets had developed, increased, and improved, women were actually losing ground after having jettisoned the tie-on pocket. So menswear had, if not improved, become standardized. So the suit transitions from the 18th century handmade to a really industrialized product with the invention of things like the tape measure. Um, you could walk into Brooks Brothers by 1850 and expect to find pockets in a ready-made suit that you could actually buy off the rack. So dependable were menswear pockets. They had become naturalized. Various wits crowed about their ample pocket endowment. Man is marsupial. A man without a pocket is a freak of nature. Women's wear uh, remained difficult to um, Difficult to fit, women continued to see dressmakers uh, through the 19th century. Um, and those dressmakers didn't always um, you know, do what you wanted. So there's a very long article, Elizabeth Cady Stanton uh, writes in 1895, describing her demand for a pocket. She pointed out that even a fight didn't guarantee results. The dressmaker manufactures excuses, tells her there is no place for a pocket, informs Stanton that a pocket would bulge you out just awful. That is the reason, presumably, the Kodak woman must carry a folding pocket camera in her hand while the guy gets to put it in his pocket without worrying about unsightly bulges. So underlying protestations about fit and fashion were questions about whether women actually needed pockets. And that that, that question was political was recognized over a century ago. Suffragists at times demanded the vote and pockets in the same breath. In her 1959 um, satire, Alice Dewar Miller used pockets to poke fun at the circular reasoning of the anti-suffragists. She substituted the word vote for pocket and then mimicked their arguments. If women really wanted pockets, they would already have them. Ergo, suffragists must not fly in the face of nature by demanding pockets. So of course, I think Miller has a lot of fun suggesting that neither the pocket nor the vote was a natural right belong, that belonged to one sex. Nor did suffragists find the alternative carrying a handbag any better. They called handbags uh, a badge of servitude. 
it must be lugged around. You have to sort of expend some kind of psychic energy to sort of remember where you've put it. Uh, it can get lost or stolen. And you know, did you really want to drag that handbag to war, as did whack recruits during World War II, when army uh, designers got squeamish and placed fake breast pockets in the uniform coat, worried after experiments that it did not look good to put cigarettes there. And so they said, OK, no pocket. Uh, well, actually, first there was a rule against using it. And then they just take it out and leave the pocket flap. So even military designers, supposedly really intent on function, were just as worried as dressmakers um, about challenging sort of cultural ideas of femininity. And critically, through the 20th and 21st century, the notion that women's clothes aren't made for pockets has prevailed. So after measuring pockets in 80 pairs of men's and women's jeans from the top 20 brands in the US in 2018, uh, Jan Diem and Amber Thomas discovered that on average, women's pockets are 48% shorter, 6.5% narrower. They also determined that these artifacts actually wouldn't fit in the pocket, you know, cell phone, your hand, pens, wallets. So, you know, it's clear that decisions go into making jeans or any other garment. And I think the notion that men's clothes are made for utility and women's for beauty prevails, right? Like centuries, centuries on. And very old ideas about women's place, about women's more limited social and economic contributions uh, are reflected in the clothing that we make and that we agree to wear. So much of the women's wear industry, notably girls wear, you go into a girl section and you can really see the difference quickly. Um, it still prioritizes aesthetics over beauty, still assumes women will wear handbags, uh, and is happy not to take on the work sewing a pocket entails. Pocket is small. It is not much expense. But it requires understanding how it's going to fit and a lot of work to sort of design it. OK, that's my, that's my speedy tour. So whether today you enjoy many capacious pockets, or just one, or not any, um, I hope I've made the case that our tools, the way we carry our tools, the way we carry our hands, is the result of 500 years of fashion's imagination and ingenuity, uh, and perhaps convince you that we suffer, we humans suffer a little bit from marsupial envy. Uh, I'm going to leave you with uh, Katie No Pocket. Um, sorry, I'm so sorry. My favorite Katie No Pocket. Um, and the problem that uh, initiates this 1944 children's book is, as the title suggests, that the kangaroo mama, Katie, has no pouch. She has no way to carry her son, Freddie, about. She must contrive to get a pocket. And so she asks around, and she ends up accosting this tradesperson, asking him where he has gotten his pockets. And he kindly makes a gift of his apron. So for marsupials, of course, it is the female of the species who enjoys pockets. Oh, while I was fussing around, I forgot to say, I think this is a secret feminist book that was hiding as a children's story because she's pointing out right the limits of this marsupial um, human comparison. All those men who said man is marsupial forgot that no, he is not actually. It is the female of the species who enjoys pockets. Um, so you know, in contriving to get them, I think she suggests that we all would prefer not to be encumbered. And that aspiration, I think, is really could be said to be the initial reason um, and an enduring one. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the design motive behind pocketing. Um, and it was first evinced 500 years ago when tailors decided to put bags into breeches. Um, and I think, you know, when they're included with thoughtfulness, um, pockets make evident sort of sustained efforts to anticipate human need, uh, to augment human capacity, um, unassuming in and of themselves, you know. I think it's pockets' capacity to carry other things, to stay literally at our sides, that makes them remarkable. Maybe just a little more remarkable than pocket lint. Okay, thank you.
sorry, that cursor was really awful. <laughs> Thank you so, <clears throat> so much. That was really fantastic. And I know that um, there will be a number of questions from folks here in the room and also on YouTube. But um, while we're letting you all formulate your, your questions, um, I just wanted to, to say um, I, I love the way you've taken something that we all take for granted. I mean, we all have to have our pockets, have <laughs> multiple pockets, mm -hmm. and really explore design history, but also cultural practice. But I wanted to ask, because you're, you covered so much ground. I was trying to race to those. <laughs> no, but in your book, it's just there's a lot there. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you framed this topic, that something that we all take for granted. Um, you're covering a lot of ground, but then um, how as a researcher do you tackle this? And, and as you got into it, was there just, mm -hmm. did you find there's a lot? I mean, I, again, is that complete, that, that from the pocket's origins up to uh, current day, you go up to, to the 2020s, and even into the future, mm -hmm. right, with smart pockets, which you didn't get to get into here, but you said 40 minutes. <laughs> you can talk about that if you like. But it's just so much. Um, but it well, works. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, um, uh, wait, so what's the question? I, I got excited and embroiled, and then I couldn't stop. And then I had to think, you know, no one is going to read a whole book about pockets. So maybe I'll just make it, you know, each chapter is thematic. You can okay. touch in, and you can just read, you know, the thing about gesture or just about children or um, what we collect. Um, so that was one thought. Um, another thought uh, was that I wanted to be fun and fun to read. Um, I think, uh, you know, folks who've been here, um, like, uh, you know, Jill Lepore have said history should be, you know, the writing should be accessible and it should be fun and it should be engaging. And I think that's always been something I've thought about a lot. Yeah, well, it works. And each of your, I think, seven chapters starts with the word pocket, different types of. It does? Yes, it does. Yes, they do. <laughs> pocket origins, pocket proliferation, oh, pocket yeah, attitudes. Yeah. I mean, so that those are the chapters that people can go to mm -hmm. to, to learn more about pocket, pocket sexism, pocket uh, inventories, pocket play, and pocket utopias. So there you go. <laughs> Great structure. Right, there. Define I what you want. Um, I also want to ask, and then we'll open it up. So please, um, Stephanie Corrigan at the back is keeping an eye on uh, YouTube questions, and we'll keep an eye on here. here. But um, we here at AAS have a lot of books, as you know, as a researcher, a lot of small books and pocket books. Did you? <gasps> that didn't end up in the book. <laughs> the, I, I did do the pocket book, which is this amazing thing. And you know, the first pocket book that I can find I don't think you have it, but it's 1644, and it's a pocket Bible. And the frontispiece says something like, to be carried at the soldier's breast, uh, you know, like, it's nice and brief. <laughs> it's, it's so that you can see what you need right, right in the heat of battle. Um, and there were wonderful pocket books that I looked at here, this notion that um, what you need to remember don't worry, we've got it covered. It can be carried in a pocket-sized book that you can carry with you. And I think that idea, I love that idea that um, your memory now is in this book, and you can carry it with you. Yeah. Um, so different Bibles and and there were pocket books. Guides, there were etiquette books. There travel was guides. travel guides, mm -hmm. um, almanacs, all sorts of beautiful uh, and lovely. I didn't make it into the book really. It's like the glancing glance, but but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and those were intended to go in, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, I'm really interested in the way the pockets, as you outline in, in, in the book, changes according to the object, in some cases, that goes into it. Yeah, uh, I mean, the specific bobs. pockets are for specific sorts of, um, I mean, specific objects come to require specific pockets. There's that great hunting pocket, what's it called, the um, poacher's pocket. Uh, the ticket pocket was tiny, so you didn't have to rummage around. You could just whip it out. Um, you know, some people call the hand jammers, you know, pockets that were nice and good for, you know, posture. I mean, I think that pockets evolve, you know, as the things we carry evolve. So, and, and as one thing that comes through in your book is that there are 
there are pockets, and then there are the things that go into the pockets, and there are things that are designed to go into pockets, a pocket size. And you did you did show some nice examples of the small mm -hmm. tools that, that were carried, which is pretty great. So it's about kind of an extension of, of the body. In okay. A way. So this is my pet peeve. When people said, "Oh, it's a fashion history book," I'm like, "No, <laughs> no, this is this is material, culture, and dress." And I was as interested in the objects as in the clothes. And really, it was this idea that you you get dressed in the morning and you you feel like you're ready, but you're only ready if you know you have everything, right? Like you can't just walk out the door with nothing. And I think I wanted to get at that idea that. Um, you feel self-possessed, but really that depends on generations of people and designers who have made all these objects that you carry with you, you know, like the Robinson Crusoe idea that we're, we're not alone, really. We have all of this technology and all these objects that um, we rely on, you know, worlds of people. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a, it's a social history in that regard. It's really nice to, that you get at so many, so many aspects uh, of, of uh, humans and the, the, how the pocket relates to it, which is why it's so fun. Um, Let's go ahead and, and let, uh, if, if there are questions, great, yeah. Oh, okay, so we have a microphone. You have to speak into the microphone or the YouTube <laughs> audience cannot hear you. Yeah, it's interesting, 100 years ago, Kodak had a small camera that you could put in your pocket. Mm -hmm. Pocket photography. Right. And the, the tagline for the po Kodak woman, I think she was actually called the Kodak girl, was you can take a, you can take a Kodak with you. And before there were wrist watches, there were pocket watches. Yeah, so I think the pocket watch fits in the um, pocket. And so that's why the watch for women is jewelry. And the, the watch was pinned to your clothes or held uh, or worn like jewelry because uh -huh. women don't have pockets. And so you don't have a fob pocket to hold it in. So technology throughout, um, you know, you see how even technology is gendered in this way, you know, like what you can carry in your pockets. I was really interested in the um, the 17th century because Mary Rowlandson speaks in her, her um, narrative of living among Wampanoags of a pocket which has to be an external pocket. But the the it irony was stolen, is, right? The seeds yeah. were stolen. Yeah, and it, she puts old food in it and it rots, and she also sticks her Bible in there. So <laughs> the the two are cohabitating. But she must know how to use this pocket because even though she's a well placed woman in her in her home she is very ingenious about um, uh, managing for herself in this very new place but I think everyone every class of woman wore a tie on pocket I don't it, think it yeah. was classed it yeah. doesn't sound like it's something that would have been restricted to and Barbara Burnham and Anna Fentineau have written an amazing book on the tie on pocket and so they go far into the tie on pocket and would argue that some were actually um, some did have sort of compartments so that you could organize it. I mean, that was one of the sort of, um, one of the, uh, what's the word? Spats. I can't think of the word, sorry. Um, women's pockets were sort of discussed like this huge vat, like the cellar of darkness, like, like who knows what went in there, while men had this, this suit that was all organized, you know? And so that was a po point of contention, I guess is what I'm gonna say, that this mysterious tie on bag who knows what, who, like, just like people talk about the purse as sort of this, like, um, you know, Warren, you know? Who knows what gross stuff is in there? Sticky candy wrappers. <laughs> so, so when did a social stigma get attached to men wearing fanny packs or carrying purses? Like, you can't imagine John Wayne with either one. No, but, but you know, so but at some point it became. It has come. So in the book, I have. I'm so excited about this. The um, that portrait of Dudley, uh, and he's in white with the black purse. I can't. Well, Dior now, and I put them together. Has this amazing um, dark blue outfit with the white purse, and you can see that the fashion handbag has come back for men with a vengeance, and it has been called frequently. Now it's called. It used to be called, like in 2015, the man purse. Happily, that has been given up. And um, But menswear fashion bags are all the rage. Most of them are across, cross shoulder. That's cooler. You know, the fanny pack still has a bad reputation. 
Stephanie has a question back on YouTube. Go ahead. We have several on YouTube, actually. Um, so Eli on YouTube asks, in cultures that adopted Western style dress more recently, did they also have a similar cultural significance? And how did pocket discourse interact with colonialism? Well, I, um, yes, once, once there is exchange, there are certainly pockets coming up in dress that has not been, um, that did not have pockets before. Um, there, I have in the book um, this amazing um, illustration of, um, uh, well, you know, the suit is not entirely a Western thing. The suit actually um, is borrowed from um, the kaftan. Uh, and the, um, I'm sorry, the, um, when folks were starting to look at suits and sort of imagine that it was this Western getup, um, there's, a, uh, in Japan, a writer who like shows everyone in Japan what this Western suit is and has to define the word pocket and say, Westerners have this funny thing as a suit and they even have places to put stuff in the suit, they, it has to define the word pocket. So it absolutely, um, I think, uh, I did not travel around the world after I, um, because my, you know, my language skills are poor. <laughs> so I, stay, I stayed with the West, but, but it, it absolutely, it certainly shifts. And I'm sorry, I'm not answering this very well, but yes. Lynn asks, could Robinson Crusoe have been wearing a shirt with a pocket? I've never seen an 18th century shirt with a pocket, but was just wondering, did you say that the error was noticed at that time? Did I say that? I think they're not shirt pockets until the 19th century. Um, and I think it might be military. And what was the second part of that question? About the era Robinson Crusoe. Of course, it was absolutely like this, like dirty joke. I mean, I think it was really funny. Um, it, you know, for years, this idea that at the time for Robinson Crusoe, the point was that his critics were saying, "Look what this ridiculous thing novels are. Novels are so dumb. People make these stupid errors. You know, he can't even his continuity is terrible. You know, and 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 that was the argument for saying fiction should. You know, that was." Defoe's critics were making fun of fiction for focusing so much on the individual and his petty, dumb life. And look, they can't even tell the story right. You know, there's all these continuity problems. So that was the origins, I think, of that of that moment. Um, but I think shirt pockets are late. Go ahead, Stephanie. Another question on YouTube. Yeah. Last one, I promise. Uh, Lori asks, were pockets a symbol of power or status? I think certainly, yeah. I mean, I think um, especially, I mean, you can see it in the 18th century suit. They're decorated. There's so much attention paid to them. Uh, I saw, when I looked at, at garments, I saw some 18th century court suits that had incredible accordion uh, sort of dividers in the pocket so that you could actually, even within a waist, um, a hip pocket, sort of divide it. Um, uh, the, I think even... You know, when we think today of, um, I don't, it, it's not status so much as this sort of like preparedness and this kind of, um, I think in the era of sort of casual dress after World War II, um, when visible pockets come into use and for World War II, it was all of the, um, the uh, army uniforms that had um, the sort of the first um, bellows pockets. And those pockets sort of show up in menswear. And I think that at that point, menswear borrows from workwear and military to suggest new ideas about competence and sexiness. And so I would argue that menswear pockets become not so much about sort of status, but a really an expressive sort of fashionable mode to suggest this elemental masculinity that, you know, that people are you know, worried about as the 20th century progresses. So, you're pocketed up, you suggest that you're really, um, you know, you're competent and sort of your daring do is sort of made evident, I think, after World War II. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the 
Um, I, I worked for years in engineering, and the mechanical engineering usually were throwbacks from 50 years, 75 years prior, and they would all have the pocket protectors, and the more pencils and pens and uh, slide rules and things they had was like a mark of their education and their status as engineers. And there were very few women engineers at the time. And think how unusual it is to actually agree to show what you have in your pocket. I mean, it's only the pocket handkerchief that's sort of allowed to come out. And I think it's really only those pocket, and you know, the engineers who, like, no one else shows everything in their pocket. That was part of their nerdiness, right? But, but, but also part of their, within their community, their status, I guess. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the purse, and then uh, for women, the our jewelry can't because we don't have a pocket uh, for our watches. Were there any other uh, fashion solutions that uh, came about because we didn't have pockets integrated in our clothing? I'm thinking like the muff, so men could put their hands in their pockets to stay warm, but women had to have a muff. You know. Should have had some muffs. <laughs> the muff is such a very furry, sexual sort of thing, and having your hands there. I mean, who knows <laughs> what was happening? But um, I think I, I think women were really felt so left out. I think about the gesture, particularly not to be able to sort of look cool and at ease. But I think the bag, the purse, is sort of the catch-all solution. Um, and women love purses, but it's also true that um, when Diana Vreeland, for example, came to Harper's Bazaar in 1937, she said, I hate the bloody handbag. I just, aw it's awful. It changes your walk, everything. I want to devote a whole issue to pockets, how amazing they are, what you can do with pockets. And she said this to the editor when she just arrived. And the editor went to the CEO or whatever who came running down <laughs> and said, do you know how much advertising Money is coming from handbags. We are not going to have an issue devoted to pockets. And of course, you know, that's what, that's the, you know, that is what makeup perfume bags is what makes up for all of the, you know, major fashion industries. So Diana Vreeland managed to get a lot of pockets in Harper's Bazaar, I can tell you, because I looked carefully. And she talked about it in much more exuberant ways than Vogue, for example. So it's sort of interesting. You can even see a little bit of difference. But no, I didn't find. Well, now I can't think in, in my head. I bet I will in like 20 minutes and say, oh. <laughs> Can you say something, uh, Hannah, about um, the future that might be pocketless? Because you did sort of, in your last chapter, you kind of looked ahead to the, the yeah. smart pocket, if you, if you will. Yeah, I was curious about this because I was curious about, um, I was looking at Wells, H.G. Wells, and he writes about, um, moving through the world without carrying a lot of junk. And he actually kind of envisions our like Apple smartphones, basically. And he's, he imagines that things will be all miniaturized and we won't have to carry stuff. And he says, you know, the future, we will be totally unencumbered. We're not going to have to, I mean, sort of think Star Trek, you know, like everyone, there's, like, there's not a lot of places to put things. Um, and so I was fascinated that he had that sort of idea early on in the 30s. Um, and then you see it in Things to Come, which is that sort of film that really set the stage for futurist clothing and minimalist clothing. And then I thought, oh, so minimalism, you know, loves this aesthetic, but it doesn't seem as though they're making a political statement, but really there isn't any place to carry stuff in minimal clothing. Um, and now I'm getting carried away. And I'm saying this because, oh, so futurists, <laughs> I think, also have this dream that the designed environment will take care of you. Mm -hmm. And you can move through the world like an easy pass system, you know, and you won't have to be encumbered by stuff. And so it's kind of go circle back. It's to like the, it's like this no technocratic problem. futuristic dream that you won't have to carry anything. Well, we already have some of it, right? You don't have to have a key because your house can have a code. You don't have to like everything is on your phone. We've sort of shrunk the number of images. Um, but I propose that people love pockets that we have no digital handkerchief, <laughs> that women are just getting them and they want them, and that there really will always be a place that you need for your hands, even if we have you know, contact lenses with you know, God knows what. You know, right? Like, what was it? Google Glass did not make it. And I'm hoping to God not much else makes it. And I think we will still uh, require our pockets. 
early, I've always worked in rare book libraries. And everyone who works in a library like this has to have a sweater at work because where we keep the books is very cold. And my husband always had, from the very earliest days of our relationship, had trouble buying me presents until he figured out that I, it, he, I could, he could always give me a sweater as long as it was washable, because okay. books are dirty things, and it had a pocket. So I have had, over these years, a collection of some of the ugliest sweaters, but they all had pockets <laughs> in them. Well, but that's hard, because knitwear really they gets lumpy, lumps. and it's like, you can it sort of you see what's in there. I'm I'm amazed. So did you? Uh, can you also knit so that you can sort of? I could have, but then he wouldn't have had anything to give. <laughs> well, on that note, I note that we are um, out of time. So thank you all so very much. Thank you, Hannah, thank for you. your fabulous presentation. Uh, and just. Uh, Remind everyone um, of upcoming programs, a couple of programs coming up next week. Um, a week from tonight, uh, Barbara Weisberg will be here speaking about her new book, um, A Scandalous Divorce in Old New York. So please join us for that. Um, and then a week following, the following Tuesday, Manisha Sinha will be here, uh, the launch of her new book, The Rise and Fall of the uh, Second American Republic, a Reconstruction, 1860 to 1920, and she will be in conversation with John Stauffer for that. So, very exciting. Um, we hope to see you back here, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Yeah, thanks for coming up. Really appreciate it.